Everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I am, as I have always been, Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. It is the eye of the needle, and it is the end of the year 2021. Will old acquaintance be forgot, never left behind? Well, pff, gosh, they're being cycled through the chipper daily now. And so we're going to take... What I think is going to be um, kind of a retrospective as well as forward-looking view of the year that almost is, was, and the one that almost is yet to be. If you followed that, um, good for you. <laughs> so with that in mind, I can think of no better person that I want to discuss the things with that are coming and the things that have been than a man who mixes his um, divinitive arts of astrology, tarot, and uh, forecasting along with um, socio-political commentary. We welcome back, after a far too long absence, Robert Phoenix. Welcome to the show. Randy, it has been far too long, and I think the old Lang Syne uh, sort of intro there is appropriate, and it's great to be back and reconnecting with you. Yeah, it is. And some of that, the listeners know, we've been, the 2021 has not been a high water year for me with interviews. Working on a book and um, sustaining sort of a smaller platform while at the same time kind of reassessing the landscape that is the media that we came into years ago and watching how that's shifting and changing as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, welcome back, my friend. It's good to see you again. Um, you're one of those people that I've actually pressed flesh with, partaken of uh, adult beverages, to use right. yeah. Rush Limbaugh's terms, right? and yeah. spend some time with in real life. And uh, that was down in Houston. What was that, 2017? This... <laughs> I think it was, um, I think it was 2017. Yeah. I, was, I was still living in Austin at the time. Okay. Yeah, you were. And um, it was this uh, crazy conference that this woman who was like a friend of yours or something put together. She was. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, that conference is a whole backstory to it. That was a, that was a, a weekend of high strangeness in itself. I mean, you go to a conference about the paranormal, you experience the paranormal. Right. And the dark side of it isn't that special. I mean, I had a zombie Uber driver and a black little black ma magician who spent most of the weekend trying to pull um, little spells off on people. And we will leave him unnamed for now, although he is somewhat well known. But yeah, it was um, it was a test of the metal. And um Frankly, my last such event, I suspect, because I'm not sure I can ever fly again. Mm. Um, I think a lot of us are facing the reality that the world we live in now has been partitioned in certain circles. I know people are flying, and I know people that are flying who have not um, complied with certain requests by certain powers that be. Mm -hmm. But um, more and more, it looks like a very different world in terms of the landscape we travel as well. So my territory now is basically where I can point four wheels in a direction and get there in, in 12 hours or so. <laughs> it's just the way it's been. I, I think a lot of people are like that. Did I ever tell you the story about what happened after that conference on my, way, on my drive home? Did I ever tell you that? I'm not sure you did. Okay, so... Um, after the conference, um, hanging out with my friend Elizabeth and um, two people that you know, and yeah. I'm not going to bring their names into uh, the story, but fairly well-known person. 
and spent a long time kind of uh, sitting around having some nacho things and and some uh, I don't know maybe a couple of beers and. I felt myself getting just completely drained by this conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, and, and, and almost like I was pinned to my chair um, at the same time, like I couldn't go. Um, so, but I eventually left and I went and I had, I had some dinner after that. And my truck was a little funky that weekend. It was a little, it, was, it was, wasn't really hundred uh percent. -huh. And I, I came to find out that I was, of a six cylinder truck it was only firing on five cylinders uh, because something was going on with, the, and I just taken the truck in for servicing. Anyway, I I'm driving back from Houston to Austin and I missed the turn to Austin and I keep going and I'm like, okay, this is wrong. And I find myself in like Seguin, which is way on the other side of, uh. of Austin and kind of, maybe midway between Austin and San Antonio. So I have to cut through Seguin and do this whole other like back trip. Right. And as, as I'm driving, my truck gets continually more funky. So I'm, I think, I think I'm taking um, maybe 283 or something like that. And there's nobody on the highway. I mean, there's just nobody there. And my truck is degrading in terms of its performance. And I'm thinking maybe I should go to a, a gas station or something. And I saw this gas station, like um, I just passed it. And it was, this is about one 30 in the morning. Again, there's, there's nobody around. Like there's just nobody there. So I, I just pull past the gas station and in Texas, the freeways will off, often have these U-turns uh, where you'll be able to kind of just and maybe other States. I don't know. We didn't have that in California. You're on a freeway on a freeway. Yeah. Uh, but you, you know, they have these islands and they have these U-turns. So I had pulled just ahead of the U-turn and I'm thinking, okay, well, I can put this thing in reverse and kind of inch it back there and drift out. And then I can just make this U-turn go in the opposite direction and get my car to this gas station. And again, one 30 in the morning, there's nobody there, nobody out. So I do this and all of a sudden this car comes up out of nowhere, probably doing about 95 miles an hour. And, and he's going to hit me right in, right in the back of my truck. And he swerves and he gets, he gets into the median, which is dirt. And he, and he, and he clips my, my front bumper. Just that's in my front light. That's the only thing he does. He clips my front light. And, and then I don't know what happens to his car. But it's, it just you know, scared the shit out of me. So I pull over back to kind of where I was before, you know, just to kind of deal with this thing and deal with this guy. And then he pulls over and he's this, I think he's either from Mexico or he's from South America. I'm getting the feeling this might have been a cartel dude. Okay. I just, mm, so the, no. so the, the reason why I said that is because he didn't want anything to do with any insurance or anything. Not that anything happened to my, my truck, you know, a little bit of a scrape on his car. That's it. Right. So, you know, he looked at his thing. I looked at my thing. I'm like, are you good? And he's like, yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this truck again comes out of nowhere and it's kind of a, uh, like a, like a Ford F-150 or something like that. And it is hauling ass. There's nobody around down the same road. And then there's a kind of a, a slight turn in the road and he doesn't make the turn. And so what happens is he goes flying into this medium and he starts rolling. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. And then the guy who clipped me decides he's, he's going to jump in his car and he's going to go down there. I don't know what he's going to do. Right. So in the, in the matter of like less than 10 minutes, this whole series of events happens right on the back end of that event. And I'm like, holy shit, something big just happened here. And I escaped something fairly significant. I don't know, you know, what, because if you play this thing out, right, if you play it out, and if that guy hits me and I'm kind of like sitting there, you know, spinning like a top or whatever, Mr. Truck is coming by right after that. And Whoa, without, yeah. without, a, without a whole lot of, um, whole lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd say vision or, or, or clarity in that moment. I, I mean, it just could have been 
completely messed up. So I had I had a little bit of protection that night coming off that event. So that was a kind of that was the, the sort of the back end story of what happened. Yeah, I had similar strange things that happened as well, including winding up at the wrong airport, leaving Houston, missing my flight, losing my mobile phone in a taxi cab that cost me a hundred dollars to drive across Houston from uh, uh, whatever airport is opposite to Bush. Right. Uh, yeah, there's, there's somehow or another, our arrangements, our ticket arrangements were screwed up and we wound up with two different airports. So it, the whole weekend in Houston was voodoo and steroids. And, you know, based on, you know, I have to look at this and go, hey, you know, we've told people for years, these conferences are loaded with spooks. And some of them are behind the podiums and some of them are behind the cash registers. And um, beware. And so um, I'm very circumspect now about any public event that I'd likely do again or even attend. But it was a good time at times when it was good. And um, we did get a chance to meet on that occasion as well. We are now in a very interesting space in time. We're on the nexus of 2021, 2022, and you know, I I was I was looking back on the whole spread of events that have occurred from a. I have a number of demarcation lines from my own timeline, starting in 2017 with that Great American Eclipse, which for me was a clock counting down and a very big shift in energy on the Earth. Um, but certainly the solstice of 2019 and the conjunction that occurred there was again another big uptick in the pressures that were being brought to bear. And then obviously, you know, we, we crossed the threshold into 2020 and by March we're in this pandemic which did not leave me unscathed as well because I wound up in the hospital exactly one week before they declared the COVID thing. So uh, I sort of dodged the bullet on that. I was treated for mm, bronchial pneumonia and got out of there pretty quick because I don't like hospitals. But that was 2020. But, you know, 2020 felt... Mm, as hard as it was like the prelude to something even darker as we moved into 2021. And, you know, we get to the end of the year, we have an, a hotly contested election, an election that in some people's minds will never be settled. We have the famous January 6th riot. Now, I, I don't know that you can call what happened there an insurrection properly we'll call it a riot and we'll call it a riot under sus suspicious circumstances we go through all of this and we get to the inauguration of joe biden in a locked down under martial law washington dc biden swearing in under a void mood as i understand it not good circumstances and so as I've gone through this year, uh, I'm technically not proficient in astrology, but I'm learning. I have watched as it looks like the sky is just lighting up, Robert. It looks like there's all kinds of signals and messages that are just pulsing in now. And it's like warning Will Robinson. So from that side of the angle, can you kind of maybe take us through what you see as some of the the highlights astro astrologically as well as um, here on this on Earth side of what you see as the big events, the big things that kind of checked your box. Yeah, so let's go back. Let's go back in time because I think it's a, a good place to start and kind of recap. You know where we've been since um, since 2019. Yeah, and uh, let's go, let's go even back before 2019. Let's let's go. Let's 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 go let's go to let's go to 2019 let's go to 2019 let and let's go to um, the 
solar eclipse uh, that takes place um, right around the uh, the winter solstice of 2019. Okay, mm-hmm. now this solar eclipse takes place over China and and mm-hmm. really not that far away from Wuhan. So you know we look at Hong Kong and Hong Kong was a seething hotbed of uh, insurrection and yep. protest and a lot of that I think was probably astroturfed um, but nonetheless it was still happening and I think that the that the Chinese government um, wanted to put a put a uh, quell to that very very quickly and they didn't want to do it in a really violent fashion because uh, violence is real is you really don't want to resort like if you're an oppressive regime you don't want to resort to open-handed videotaped violence yeah echoes of Tiananmen square again which are still yeah. living with the uh, blots of any it's any 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 regime yeah does not want to have full-on now they can have micro events of violence right which is different but they don't want to go in and just start bulldozing people in Hong Kong. So now we have COVID COVID comes up right around that time. And then prior to that, I think it was um, August of 2019, the Chinese mandated vaccines for everybody. So a lot of people don't realize that yeah. but everybody in China had to get a vaccine. So what was going on with that vaccine? Do we know? We, we really don't know. And if you really spend a lot of time looking at the so-called pandemic in China, it's relegated mostly to Wuhan. I mean, there are other kind of pockets and outbreaks, but you didn't really get a sense that Shanghai was locked down. Wuhan was locked down. Well, why was Wuhan locked down? Well, Wuhan theoretically is one of the larger areas of people that are not happy with things in China because it's uh, ecologically, it's a cesspool. Yeah. I mean, they've got pollution, the living conditions in Wuhan are terrible. So you had a group of people who were getting, uh, were being less enchanted with their situation. Of course, the Chinese don't want that. So I think a lot of what happened with the so-called virus and the pandemic, again, if you're going to be very kind of um, specific, let's say you have a batch of vaccines, which we know might be different in one place and another place, right? So the people in Wuhan might've gotten a very different kind of vaccine, which may not have purported to do the things that they wanted to do. That all happens in August. By the time December rolls around, which is when we're getting into this eclipse phase, a lot of the theater starts to take place. And we, we begin to see this thing start to kind of, just like the eclipse, just kind of move across, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. move across sort of the West. And by the time we hit February, now we're into uh, February, 2020, I believe February is the first recorded case in the state of Washington. Yep. And, and it's like, okay, here we go. This thing is here now and the world is going to change. And if you go back in time and look at, the, the big, which I think was the really big um, conjunction, it was the conjunction of Saturn and Pluto. Yes, exactly. Which, which happened in January yep. of, of uh, uh, 2020. And this is, this is uh, something that I worked with a lot and, uh, you know, basically said, look, the world's going to change here. I mean, it is going to fundamentally change. It's going to change how we live, change where we live, um, and you better figure out where you want to be when it changes because it's going to get harder and harder to move after this change. And almost like clockwork, in the Saturn Pluto conjunction happens. And then on March um, 11th, 311, uh, an interesting moment in time. Occurs. Yeah. You have Rudy Gobert, who plays for the Utah Jazz, and he's the first person in the NBA to be um, diagnosed with. COVID and he's clowning around and he's rubbing his hands on the mic. I mean, he couldn't have been more um, sarcastic and, and, and uh, just um, in a lot of ways disingenuous. Now you have to understand here also that the NBA has a very close relationship with China. Very, very close. I did so, not know that. Oh God. It's, it's huge in China. Wow. Like the, like, like the NBA gets so much residual income and revenue from China. In fact, you could probably make a case that they get more residual income and revenue from China 
than you do from the United States. It's a population uh, numbers game, right? So Gobert, um, who uh, probably has a lot of uh, deals in China, sp- sponsorship, just like many other NBA players, was probably given the order to, you're the guy. You're going you're gonna to start this all. You're the point, man. Off. Right, right. So um, when that happened, when I saw him that night, I'm like, okay, I got to go to the store. <laughs> and I did. I went, I went to HEB and I bought a ton of shit. Yeah. Um, Cause I knew what was going to happen next. Now I was already like ahead of that. I, you know, I knew the toilet paper thing was going to come. I just knew it. <laughs> so I had the toilet paper thing ready to go. I didn't care. And then I went in and I just, I topped everything off. And then I just sat back and I watched, I watched as everything just got drained out. I'm like, okay, well, here we go. So 311, of course, is a very interesting day. Um, 311 in 2011 was when Fukushima happened. Yes. So there's this interesting kind of sync, um, sync going on with 311. And that really thrust us into that period of time. Now, Saturn goes into Aquarius right after this. And now we're, 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 we're dealing with... Uh, you know the 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 hard version of Aquarius, right? Saturn, Saturn, Saturn being the you know the 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 Lord of Time and contraction yeah. and yep. restriction. Um, we're dealing with the hard version of Aquarius, which is one rule for all, right? One rule for all, one law for all, and you all have to do it together. And this was um, a very important event because we had not had a global event like this since maybe world war ii yeah and even world war ii didn't touch places like bolivia or peru right i mean these are countries that are kind of you know out of the scope of world war ii i mean it did manage in places like mm-hmm. australia because there are australians that fought in world war ii in canada right north africa um asia but clearly there were countries this was global so this was unlike anything that we had ever seen before and, and it involves Saturn. So we have the lockdown. We have the Saturnian high priest who yes. uh, take, takes the manifestation of Anthony Fauci, who, of course, is a Capricorn, and he's ruled by Saturn. So he becomes the hierophant of new science, right? <laughs> so so this is what we wind up dealing with, and it's very hard. It's a very, very hard pill to swallow. And really what we saw with Saturn, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, was the end of what we would call so-called democracies, republics, um, the you know sort of the Western system of theoretically voting and having leadership. That was gone. That was the other thing was Saturn. Well, or the illusion of those things was it's, gone. It, you know, well, I mean, it, it's gone. I mean, yeah. we're, we've moved on, right? Like who yeah. who did who determines how things happen now, right? It's not it's not it's not Biden. He doesn't do anything. No, no. Who, de- who determines what happens now are a bunch of faceless people who are part of groups and consortiums and think tanks and uh, paid consultants. And no, uh, this lo- is the technocracy. Absolutely. The so the top down is, a, is Brzezinski's technocracy machine that he prophesied in the 70s. That's right. So the Saturn Pluto conjunction is, is the end of this idea of statism. It's over. It's done. Because decisions now are being made in a very, very different way. And in fact, you had people that were the heads of hospitals um, who had more power than the congressman yeah. who represents me here in the state of Texas. Yes. Because they're dictating policy, right? So you had, you had these uh, policy wonks, many of whom don't even have degrees in medicine. Um, you know, who are administrators. They're called hospitalists. That's the yeah. term for them now. Hospitalists. And, well, they're, yeah. they're, they're, uh, they're dictating policy. Yes. Right? And then they have these support, little little support factions. But And, and believe it or not, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce plays into this hmm. because the Chamber of Commerce makes recommendations to business, right? So if the Chamber of Commerce says, well, we need to shut businesses down, in concert with the hospital and then pointing the finger at say the city council or the mayor and saying, look, if this thing goes South, it's on you. You could be open to litigation. All these deaths uh, will be on your watch. So you just better do what we tell you to because we're the experts and we, we get the best information. So just step in line. 
right? And this is how decisions are made now. People just pass the buck because the so-called experts are the ones that are telling them what to do. And so if something goes wrong, you can point to the experts and say, well, they told me to do this, right? I mean, and we just see this, you know, th this three-card Monty of everybody pushing blame and lack of accountability onto another person. It's a perfect system. Nobody ever has to really take the fall. Yeah, there's no accountability. There's no accountability. So this is what happened during that time. And, we're, and that goes all the way up to the election, by the way, because when the election happens, we don't really have an election. Be, and the reason why is because with that Saturn-Pluto conjunction, and remember Capricorn rules things like governments, uh, corporations, hierarchies, presidents you know the, i mean it's over it's done pluto has has done its number we're on to something different so that election was not obviously not what it was it wasn't like any other election we had ever seen there'd be a, there have been other iterations of that thing but not to that degree not to that scale yeah not to that scale not to that degree we um i can tell you that what happened here in Pennsylvania, which was actually a benchmark uh, early in the contesting of the election, was that the uh, governor here pretty much through the Secretary of State and by fiat deemed that we could do universal absentee balloting, something that had never been allowed before. And not only did they do that, but the manner in which ballots were deposited, they were putting ballot boxes on literally public venues, especially in Philadelphia. There are stories that still circulate around here. I mean, I live one mile from the state capitol on the other side of the river here, and on the famous Susquehanna River. And um, the stories are still circulating about all the back-end deals that were done in terms of rig voting machines, um, stuffing boxes, hauling ballots away. Uh, pretty much everybody knows on some level, but it's, it's the wink-wink kind of thing where it's like, if you know, then you know not to say too much. And that really is where we're at now. It, the, well, the plutocracy sort of kicks in at this point and you have a cabal which is pretty open at this point that we're being run by a cabal but at the same time this pretense of an election was really the death knell for anything we would call um democracy and i grimace when i say that because really we were supposed to be a republic right right so you're absolutely right. And I remember when uh, Corey Lewandowski, <laughs> who uh, went to, uh, <laughs> it was no longer on the Trump train, uh, Corey no. Lewandowski and, and a group of people went to Philadelphia to uh, basically mm -hmm. figure out what was going on there in Philadelphia. Yep. And the, uh, the mayor of Philadelphia sent the sheriff in. And the sheriff uh, basically told them to go get fucked. And the sheriff is supposedly the person that is the one elected official that stands up for people's rights, yes. right? So, so now this sheriff was duly elected, right? But clearly was another kind of astroturf person put into place so that when they rang the bell... Um, the sheriff showed up and did the exact opposite of what the sheriff was supposed to do. So, yeah, I mean, and this is a, this whole thing with the election is it's, 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 you know, I'm not necessarily sure how we re resolve this on a, on a collective level because it, there's no completion there, right? There's no sense of completion. There's no sense of closure. It's like a program that's just running in the background, chewing up all this information and data, along with all these other programs running in the background, like 9-11, like JFK, you know, just running in the background, chewing up information and data. And, you know, we have to close these programs, right? We have to figure out a way to close the programs 
And, you know, and I guess, you know, doing a hard reset would be the way that we close those programs. And we could talk about what I think that would be maybe a little bit later. Definitely. But, but yeah. we have, we have to close the program, right? We can't. And not only see from my standpoint, though, I think the opposite. I think the more disfracted this all becomes, the more scattered it is, the more distorted the lens is, the perceptual lens, the better it fits into the zeitgeist right now. We're, we're living in a time when attention spans have never been shorter. Right. IQs have plummeted. Mm -hmm. um, people now are, everybody is fragmented and shattered because they've gone through what is effectively a universal MK Ultra programming. Huge, huge. Huge. And, and the, you know, it wasn't lost on me. It wasn't lost on a lot of people, especially people who went through programs that the effects of that is largely that you live your life with a shattered sense of self and this uncertainty of a, a reality at any given time because you can be switched. And that's what you began to see in this polarization, how information was spun out. You watched the information that came from the CDC website, for instance, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, the AMA, all of the professional organizations, information, and I watched it because I work in a, in a medically aligned in, in industry. I watched the information shift hour by hour, where protocols changed, methods changed, advisements changed, um, information would be inverted and reversed. Um, information was taken down, it was put up. I mean, I don't know how many billions of screenshots probably most of um, the uh, researchers out there had taken over that first six month period, just to be able to compare information and go, but they said this then. And now they're saying this now and Fauci was doing it in real time. Right. Um, so in a sense, what we live in now is the fractured mirror. And the shards of that are basically like some sort of psycho disco light that's just you know we're dancing under this under this light as as human human skeletons kind of i, I have these macabre images of this whole period yeah you, know, you know i think your perspective is uh as it being the right thing for the time for people to uh wrap their heads around i i think that's true for some people Maybe for you, that's true, because you can make sense of the chaos in a kind of a, a unique way. I love the chaos. They, and I, I don't have a problem with chaos either. <laughs> yeah. But there, are, but there are other people that can't and don't. And yeah. these people, I think, are, are, are real trouble. And um, let's just go back, because I want I don't want to gloss over what you said about being run through an MK Ultra program. Let's look at 2020. Let's look at what happened in 2020, just alone, right? We had the whole... The COVID lockdown drama, two weeks, two years later, yeah. that starts. Mm -hmm. And just as people are starting to say, you know what, you said two weeks and we're not feeling really good about this. Then what happens? Well, then you have the summer of Floyd and, and then you have the, you know, essentially the, 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 the coup of America. I mean, this is where yeah. optics of the coup really take place. Yes. The tearing down of the statues, um, the, the, the kneeling, Right, the bowing, mm -hmm. the yeah. kneeling, which is dis disgusting and deplorable, and and you know what's really interesting. I, I did a little background into um, this event uh, called uh, well, what is it? Uh, 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 Aspen Institute. They have a festival called Aspen yes. Ideas. Yeah. Okay. So I looked at the last physical event that they had with Aspen ideas. And I saw some very interesting things in the, in the roster of the people that were there to attend Aspen. I, if people don't know uh, uh, what the uh, uh, Aspen festival is, uh, the Aspen Institute is like a think tank. Mm -hmm. It's this intersection between progressive politics, kind of feel good, new age, spirituality, some technology, it's kind of an incubator to get people to fork off to the left with kind of a new religion or new, you know, sort of 
vibe of consciousness, right? That's sort of what it is. Yeah, it's sort of a blending of South by Southwest and Big Sur in some way. Right. And, the, and, the, and they've been moving more and more towards climate change. Like that yeah. became their sort of tabula rasa. And so I went back and I looked at the last um, uh, Aspen Ideas Festival and the, the, the participants were quite interesting. One of the participants was Alicia Garza for Black Lives Matter. And I thought, oh, well, here's Alicia Garza. And then I went through and there were a whole group of people that were invited from Duluth, Minneapolis, and St. Paul. And they were all either involved in public utilities, um, government, kind of low-level government, uh, city count government, county government, and um, public advoc advocacy groups. I mean, they're all there in Aspen, right? Alicia Garza is there in Aspen. I'm like, wow, this is this is interesting. What's really going on there? And then what was really interesting is I went through and they have a, a list of uh, like endowments, foundations, where, you know, there are these endowments that send people to go there and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, have a, have a week there. And um, Chick-fil-A has an endowment at the Aspen Institute. I'm like, I wouldn't is have guessed that. No, right? I wouldn't have either. But it's not a one-time thing. So Chick-fil-A sends its people to the Aspen Institute to go there. And, and, and that Chick-fil-A supposedly this big Christian, you know, uh, company and, and um, stands for all these values and shuts down on Sunday. Well, who's one of the guys that's out there shining shoes uh, for, um, you know, this whole post-George Floyd era? It's the CEO for Chick-fil-A. <laughs> He's on, he's on some kind of a Christian talk show and he's shining some guy's shoe. He's like, yeah, you should just go ahead and shine his shoe. Right. And so you can see, if you go back to that Aspen Institute uh, festival ideas, you can kind of see the players that are going to take place in 2020. It's very interesting. Wow. So that happened, the whole George Floyd thing happens. We got the COVID thing. Oh, and guess what? Then we have the election thing that all happens in the span of one year, one year. And if you want yeah. to go January to January, throw January 6th in, right? That is enough trauma in one year to encapsulate a 50-year lifespan. Yep. One year, right? And now you've got people walking around like zombies, not knowing what to do, where to go, who to believe, choosing sides, you know, thinking one side is the winning side. And so they're just going to be on that side and they don't care because they'll look at the losing side and the losing side. Well, you lost the election. You lost January 6th. Um, you lost all these other things. You're losers. I'm going to be with the winners. I trust the winners. Let me roll up my sleeve. There's a lot of that psychology involved. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just yeah. So during that astrologically, astrologically, we're dealing with the true note in Gemini. And everything gets bifurcated. Everything gets polarized. I mean, I could, we could do a whole show on that, which I've done many times. A lot of people who have, who have you know listened to me kind of lay this out will understand that we were we went through a Janus ritual, and we're still in the midst of a Janus ritual. Yeah, very much. Yeah. And the Janus ritual takes place in a time of war. Well, what are we in? We're in a time of war. It's a war against what? A virus, right? So, um, I mean, there's another level of the war going on, but that's just the surface level. So what happens? We all have to don masks because that's part of the Janus ritual. And somewhere on the other side of this Janus ritual, which I believe will be January, the end of January, um, then we'll be moving out of this Janus ritual. And theoretically, fundamentally, society will have been changed enough so that the people may not be able to take off their masks, although perhaps that might be encouraged to some degree, but the people who've been wearing their masks this entire time will <clears throat> take the masks off. They will be unveiled. And we can kind of see them already. But so you're see. talking about that metaphorically in a way. In a sense, what we're seeing is that while the public is still to whatever degree, and this varies widely according to locale, um, are masked you wearing the you know the face nappies um, the real players are suddenly pulling off the masks and showing themselves for who they really are that's right 
That's right. Interesting. Yeah. So it gets into this whole idea of inversion that um, yes. has, be, has become the the sort of the the dark magical spell of our time. And um, I was talking with uh, Nish about this on her show. And one of the things that is kind of this uh, magical trick that they've that they've performed with inversion is that the way that they've <clears throat> set up society right now is that society has become binary, right? You're either on the left or the right. You're either saved or not saved. You're either vaxxed or unvaxxed. Mm -hmm. It's just zero one zero one zero one zero one, right? There's there's no area for nuance or interpretation it's all zeros and ones now if you go into identity which generally tends to be binary right now there's 78 <laughs> versions of identity yeah so, so there's, there's there's the fractures right so what they've done is they've done this again this magic trick yeah we're, we're going to take reality we're going to make it binary we're going to make it zeros and ones and by the way zeros and ones are going to be the language of the metaverse Mm -hmm. Whereas identity, we're going to confuse identity so much that the binary relationship with identity, which, you know, and again, there, there, there can be some pliability with that. But are there 70 versions of that pliability? Right. I mean, that's really a, a kind of another like formula. Like another Well, in the metaverse, you can be whoever you want to be. Absolutely. You can Steve, be whoever you want to be. Right? This is what... Um, Oh, gosh, I did a show with Dr. Shamil Asher. must have been 2016 when we were foreshadowing this stuff then, talking about it and calling it the simulacrum, right. which is basically what the metaverse is. It is basically replicating the real world into the binary and then transmigrating or transplanting the actual human souls into it. It's right. a conveyance system for what I view as basically soul capture. Right. Which, by the way, makes the whole Omicron, uh, David Bowie, and I, I hate to be random, but I can't let that escape this Omicron thing. And then the David Bowie videos that popped up from that game that came out back in, what was it, 97? Right. When, when, when Bowie did those, um, those voiceover animations. So the backstory behind that game, <clears throat> and you know, I interviewed David Bowie right away. Yeah, that's why I brought it up. Yeah. So, so the backstory behind that game is that game was developed by a French um, mm -hmm. video game creator. I think his name is was it is it David? It's not David Cross. It's something like that. I, but he has a French name too. Yeah, I wish I could remember it now, and I can't. It's so, just... so it's very easy for me to go into Google, but I'm not going to do that. So, so he had a, he had a um, video company called Quantic Dreams, mm -hmm. and this this was a guy that had come out of I think music and film, and he decided that he wanted to do this um, game called Omicron Nomad Soul, and he put all this time and energy. Uh, into this game, right? The creation of the game. And then he took it to an English company um, and the English company liked the game and they wanted to get behind the game. They said, we'll, 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 uh, we'll finance the game. So there were other people besides David Bowie that were theoretically, um, you, you know, talked about for that, that role of being that, that character. One of the people they talked about was Bjork. Um, the other person they talked about was Peter Gabriel. But and all of those, all three of them share a certain, first off, ambiguity and sort of an androgyny as well. Yeah, I would say so. And the, the, the English game company said, we want you to use Bowie. So Bowie comes in mostly, in my opinion, as a hired gun. Right, they're willing to pay him. Yeah. The script, the script is already made. He may have made a few additions. One of the things that they did do is that they, I think, they had a live performance with his band. Um, Gail Ann Dorsey's a character um, in the game. She's his bass player at that time. Reeves Gabrell um, is part of his band. So he's a Gabrell wrote 
a fair amount of the soundtrack. The story that right. I heard was originally they wanted to use Heroes mm -hmm. as part of the soundtrack, and Bowie said, I'll go you one better. I'll give you a, a full original soundtrack. Right. So apparently that was the deal that I read somewhere else. Right. So, so I, I, you know, and we could get into a whole discussion about Bowie and his ambiguity and the light and the dark side of Bowie and a lot of strange, magical, occult references with Bowie. I feel like uh, the, the, the bigger discussion is about the video game creator. Yes. Yeah. Because he's gone on to create other video games, which I've looked at, haven't played them, but there's always a theme of either cloning or um, uh, possession, voodoo, um, AI. Like it's a, and he's his latest one is about Detroit. It's something called Detroit Three Thousand or something like that. You know, and by the way, uh, if you go look at the game, um, the game is actually open source and online. If you can still, I think you can still run it on mm, Windows Seven. I think Windows right. Seven, probably the last version. But for its time, it was pretty sophisticated. I mean, this is 1997. We were still dealing with The Sims and um, Grand Theft Auto type games at that point. Right. Not the, anywhere near the level of sophistication that we have now. Oh, so, exa yeah, exactly. Um, that was actually, um, that game came out in, I think it was 90, it was 98. Okay. Yeah, I, it was. It was produced. I think in in ninety seven was ninety seven. Yeah. Oh. Now here's this gets back to the kind of the alternative media thing you and I were talking about. Mm -hmm. So people in our attempt, because we have been kind of indoctrinated into a mystery school without knowing it, um, people like to look for hidden code and meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, guilty as charged because that's it's fun, it's interesting, and that's where. That's where you know a lot of the a lot of the buried treasure it is. So uh, people automatically say, "Oh, David Bowie, Omicron, Nomad Soul, Omicron." Oh, who put it out? Bill Gates. Well, yeah, I see. you know, Microsoft licensed it for its platform. Okay, there were two two platforms. There was that, and there was Activision, I think, or, or Dreamcast. Dreamcast. Yeah. It was it was a licensing platform. Like Bill Gates didn't sit down no. with David Bowie and say, "Let's create no. this thing so that we can somehow encode the future and give people some predictive programming." And twenty five years from now, we can all have a good chuckle about it. That didn't really happen that way. And I and I pushed, and we've gotten to this point now where. It's kind of ubiquitous where it's in there. There are a lot of things that people look for. And, oh, well, there's 666 here. And, you yeah. know, there's all these things yeah. there. And some of those things are valid and true and real. But you have to, you know, again, look at them in their context. And what are they really saying? What are they really meaning? But it's just kind of like this low-hanging fruit. And it's like, look what happened. Bowie, Gates, Omicron, CCC. There's a there. Yeah, really? It just kind of described the whole QAnon thing. And that, that's it's like QAnon 101. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And that's not to say that there aren't things that are connected. Right. There there are things that are connected, but they're not always connected in the way that we lay them out. And some of the ways that they're connected are more complex in some ways more interesting than sort of the dime store breakdown and description of it fitting into a reality that we want to use as a mirror so that we can get through a very dark time. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me, it's become less about foraging for these, I guess, you know, hidden Easter eggs inside of video game type of things and more looking at big picture, being able to zoom out and look at things and, and synchronicity will come into play. You know, it's entirely possible that, the synchronicity was that there was this game and that David Bowie happened to be in it. And it's just that from my standpoint, Bowie's sort of an icon who seems to pop up in interesting places and in interesting ways, culturally, is very transcultural person. And he is by no means irrelevant in his absence. In fact, in some ways, he's become more relevant 
which I find interesting. But, um, you know, I think at this point, there's a lot of people out there, let's face it, it's a cottage industry on the independent media level, the people that deal with this. And it's a market because there are people who love to be fascinated. And there are people who love to have uh, people who are explainers kind of unravel the mystery for them thread by thread, week by week, you know. And, and I get that, but I think, like you're saying, there's some more interesting nuance to all of this that maybe even gets plowed under by what is now so flagrantly obvious. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And there are even times where I sit back, I step back and I kind of observe what I do. And, and, and I want to say, I don't want to ask myself, well, am I still relevant? Right. Because everybody and their brother and their sister has a freaking YouTube channel and a podcast. And uh, when you started doing this a long time ago, you were really way out in front. Um, I started doing this in 2010. So, but I was doing it on, on just podcasting. So I've been doing this now for going on 12 years. Yeah. Um, I got to YouTube a little bit late. I got to YouTube around 2015, I think, 2016. My audios were on YouTube, but my videos weren't on YouTube. So, you know, for a lot of people, this is still very exciting terrain for them. They're just discovering it. They're discovering the power of alternative media. Um, and, for, and it is a moving parade. I get that. And, I, and for some of those people, I'm like, good, yeah. good, go, use it, do it right? Find something, express yourself. You know, it's more decentralized, get a group, get a niche, whatever that is. And I, I'm all for it. Right. And there's a lot of different strains of alternative media out there. It's not just people like me and you who are breaking things down. There's a lot going on that it's pretty interesting. So, uh, but we're, we're, you know, this last year, we almost reached this kind of oversaturation point. Right. And, and Q, QAnon has a lot to do with that in a lot of ways. Um, but we went through something very intense and we're still not through it. You know, we are still not through what we went through um, in, in, in my estimation in, in 2020 alone. Like we're still processing 20 freaking 20. And 2021 has its own layer. Right. And getting back to, you know, the, the uh, Saturn Jupiter conjunction on the winter solstice of 2020 that's a big deal it's a really big deal because now jupiter enters into the picture and now we have another player that is um in competition with saturn right because at that time we had the saturnian model we had uh, fauci lord fauci and um lord tedros and lord gates and all these other lords telling us what to do and now here comes jupiter and jupiter brings a different um, energy to uh, to the game. You know, the universe likes a good game, right? It's like, you know, that side was stacked. Well, let's bring something else into the picture here so that the other side has to deal with this other thing. Now, when you get into a Jupiter conjunction of anything, it's going to make that thing bigger, right? I mean, that's the nature of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we can see the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. Well, Jupiter's just going to make Fauci and Tedros and Gates and all these technocrats just bigger on some level. That's true. Right. On the other hand, there are people who entertain this idea notion that we can be more free. We can be more decentralized. We don't need hierarchies. Um, what we need is we need to bring some structure into these kind of big and eccentric ideas that we have. And that's coming into play. So now you're seeing these two dynamics, like these two globes behind me, right? One side represents the, the, the expansion of the Saturnian force, which is um, for the greater good. Right? They're going to tell you what the greater good is. The other is the compression of an idea which is expanding, and that expansion of that idea is quite interesting. And that is going to be part of this 20 year cycle um, that we're in now. And we're just, we're just getting started. Like we're just kicking 
this 20 year cycle. So what is the idea and what is the compression? Well, the idea could be any number of things, right? I mean, when it's Aquarius, it's unusual, it's different. Um, it's going to be genius. It's going to be mad. It's going to involve groups of people. It could be subgroups, could be large groups. Um, okay. so, so the idea is has something to do with innovation and being unique and looking at reality from a very different perspective and even beginning to construct reality from a very different perspective. So one of the things that I've done on my, my show for the last three days is I've, I've played a video by um, Asha Logos. Are you familiar with those videos at all? I am not until okay. I heard your last video. So Asha Logos showed up, I think about a year and a half ago, two years ago on YouTube. Uh, he's, I think, located in Eastern Washington. Uh, seems to be kind of rooted in what I would call more along the lines of a Germanic, Norsk, Northern European tradition. Okay, mm -hmm. so when you say things like that, all of a sudden it will raise hackles on the back of people's necks and say, well, he's a Nazi. Well, he's not a Nazi. What he is, is he is unabashedly European. Okay. Right. People are unabashedly african or black yeah. or unabashedly hispanic right yeah. that's his that's his background that's his um lineage and trajectory so you can see that everything is sort of kind of cast in that mold and his latest video i think is very profound and he talks about creating parallel systems or yes. parallel societies or parallel orders so this is a big idea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this is a very big I've idea. I've talked about this, yes. And then he talks about, and he gets into structure. Like, what can we do? And he spends the first probably 45 minutes of the video really nailing the time that we're in. Like, totally nailing it. Nailing the people. Nailing the, the exact same thing that you and I talked about at the beginning of the video, which is the reign of the technocrats, where nobody has any accountability. Right. And it's all run by this group consensus of experts and he breaks this thing down in such a way that it is, it is almost entirely irrefutable and then he goes into well what can we do how do we counter this force that has unlimited money i mean think about that they have unlimited money at their disposal they print the money unlimited money vast resources they have the media what they don't have is numbers like, I think we overestimate the number of people that are really involved to that degree. <laughs> I right? think we, <laughs> yeah, I think we overestimate the number of people who are actually even on the earth itself. But that's another conversation. I would agree. I would agree with you. That's a, we could go into a dive there. Uh, I would agree <laughs> with you. But what he talks about is the creation of kind of a new earth. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and so here we are now. This is, Saturn is starting to interpenetrate kind of the, the bigger idea, right? And what that bigger idea looks like. And some of it has a very kind of agrarian sort of um, point of view, right? But it's not completely agrarian. You know, this is not some kind of back to the land movement that was popular in the 1960s. This is something a bit right. different. It's not so, whole earth catalog. No, it's not store brand, right? Yeah, Which, right, right. Yeah. Um, so this, to, and to me, this is exciting. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I'm going to give the QAnon people some credit here. Okay. And the credit I'm going to give the QAnon people is because I think intuitively that's the world that they aspire to, Yeah. right? That is the world that they aspire to. And they got led by false shepherds into limited hangouts. See, the, for me, that was one of the first separations, even before Corona and the um, jab issue came in, was watching how people separated on sides around the QAnon, and specifically all of the decryption and um, aggregation of all, all the Q information. And there were people that I deeply respect, dearly love, who bought into this. And 
In most cases, I try to keep a respectful distance and allow them to go through it, not holding to the concept that I knew this was a ruse, but that I was skeptical pretty much to the nth degree about it. Because I've seen this before. And I think anybody that has been on the other side of the curtain of the cryptocracy has seen this kind of gambit before. This is very Wizard of Oz-ish in a sort of um, the calculus that goes on in messaging and how messaging is conducted. The semantics, the, the flags that are, that are flown over this, um, but draped with deep ideology of what was being, you know, I know a lot of those people now are starting to come out of the fog about this, especially as Trump continues to open his mouth and dig himself deeper into the well of um, disbelief with his promotion of the vaxes and, you know, his self-aggrandizement and his need to be egoically pumped. I mean, he was even willing to take props from Biden. Biden gave him props for the, you know, warp speed thing, and, and, and he was chuffed about it. So I give credit to the people who dug through it and maybe just said, I'll put this to one side and let it be. But a lot of people stake deep ideological ground into it, and unfortunately, a lot of those people have gone silent, or they've just simply turned and went in another direction and went, eh, close the door on that one. Uh, it's, it's a cautionary tale. Yeah, the whole QAnon thing is really fascinating because it starts off, it really starts to happen right after the Las Vegas shooting. Mm -hmm. And, um, which is a really big event um, in its own right. But, um, and, and I started to watch it. I'm like, well, this is kind of interesting. And then about maybe three or four weeks into it, maybe about a month into it, I started to find it a bit less interesting. And then very rapidly, you saw this franchise erupt, right? Like, like QAnon became the McDonald's of the truth movement. And um, you have people like Jerome Corsi spending fucking six, seven hours a night just going yeah. through all these things. And you had these uh, people on YouTube and, you know, getting ungodly numbers because they were breaking down you know, cute material. And I would sit there and I'd listen to some of them. And, uh, you know, uh, with all due respect, some of them were complete morons. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, they were. But they, they were, but they had this thing and they, they were talking about it and kind of making sense. And they're getting 40,000 views. And, and even some, some of the people who weren't morons and who were getting a lot of big numbers, I uh, was like, there, there, there was a part of me and I'll be, and I've said this before, there was a part of me that was a little resentful actually, um, <laughs> seriously. And, and yeah. I had, I had to deal with that, you know, I'm like, okay, well, look, if this wakes up a bunch of people and, you know, we get, you know, we get on the same side, the same team, I'll push that aside. Right. But I remember watching this one guy called the praying medic who was very, very popular. I do remember this one. Yeah. And, and then there is, and he, man, people loved him because he was a Christian and uh, he, he had been, I guess, a medic in Iraq and he had all this, you know, kind of, kind of valor, right. He had the valor. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was a period where Q had not been posting drops for a while. And I watched him do a show and it was really uncomfortable, right? I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Now, this guy has to continue to create material and content, and he doesn't have the decoder script. And I felt, and I gave him some credit because at least he tried to do it, but he wasn't very good. And when I would bring these things up on my show from time to time, boy, did I get a bucket full of shit from people. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I pretty much left it alone. And the one thing I'll say about um, the whole QAnon movement is that it got a bunch of baseball moms 
to wake up to the truth in some ways. Now, the the, the pipeline and the fuel for the QAnon movement was pedophilia, trafficking, and adrenochrome. That was hand. the original premise, yes. The two go hand in hand and because that's the hook, right? Now you get people in with the hook and it's the kids. And now they, now they care about something. And I'm not saying that those things didn't happen, by the way, and they're not true, right? But now they can discredit Well, them. and see, actually, in my right. mind, the reverse of that is that all of that was brought in and then it was discarded right. when it is a point. Absolutely. Now it's discredited. And that's exa exactly what happened. Like, we're going to use this. We're going to bring it out. We're going to show you what, what we do. And then we're going to make fools of you. And we're going to make Randy to me, it was just like what happened with uh, the McCarthy era communist trials, right? Exactly. Yeah. Same, yeah. same thing. We're going to give you show trials. We're going to show you there's commies, but just a few. And then when we're done, we'll discredit Car McCarthy. We'll, we'll make fun of this. Oh, yeah, like there's a red under every bed. Ha, ha, ha. We'll just move on so nobody ever goes there again. And they 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 brought it out. They exposed it. And then they moved on. Same thing with QAnon. It's interesting. And that concludes this edition of Off Planet Radio. Happy New Year. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Now go find it. This is Off Planet Radio.